All right, this is Bruce the Barber Beefcake, and you're listening to In Your Head Online.com. So, what you going to do when the barber cuts your hair and stops all over you? <laughs> all right, we are back, and we're joined by Luscious Johnny V. Johnny Valiant, welcome to In Your Head. Yes, sir. Well, how are you guys doing? Doing good, and yourself? Okay. Just came in here off the subway here. It's a little chilly night here in New York, and uh, I'm getting a little, little nippy out there. Uh, you ever get noticed on the subway? Yeah, if I don't pay the fare. <laughs> 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 that doesn't work. You know, they give you a $50 ticket. I lit up a pipe one. <laughs> I think the subway uh, platform. I didn't think there was anybody there. 11 to 30 at night, i got to get back into the subway and... Uh, I just, I got pinched, you know, cost me 50 bucks. I told the guy who I was, he didn't, you know. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, he didn't know who I was. That's what that made it worse. <laughs> oh, you're was, re- you were wasting time with me for you get all these terrorists and shit, you know, looming around New York City. Are you trying to, you know, break my, you know, break my chops, you know, 11.30 at night, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not allowed to smoke, you know. You know I said, Christ, there's nobody out here in the platform, you know. And uh, I had a good night in Brooklyn to pay the fine and try to talk my way out of it. They had some, some I guess uh, it's some kind of some broad and a herringbone tweet <laughs> <laughs> talking about health issues. You shouldn't be smoking, period, and everything. So I, don't know. I had my wife there. My wife's Chinese. I guess everybody thought it was a conspiracy to overthrow the MPA or something. I, I had no idea. I guess that answers our friend, the Gibbering Mathers question, who wants to know, do you, stim- do you still smoke cigars? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I, not, you know, not compulsively, but I, uh, <laughs> I smoke two kinds. The uh, first kind that I like is the, the uh, like a Maduro type, you know, real dark and long and all this stuff, and uh, I enjoy those, you know, and, and certainly not anything expensive. And the other kind I like is the... Uh, Brody cigar, which is the old, uh, I guess your Italian, Italian uh, working man type cigar, you know, with the picking the pitches and everything. It's a very inexpensive cigar, and I used to get those up around Scranton, PA, and uh, we still get them here and there. So I, I enjoy smoking cigars. Sometimes I use a lighter, sometimes a match, sometimes I just, uh, I just uh, enjoy it, especially after a meal or something, and uh, have a little bit of wine and. Uh, Maybe and um, just get back a little bit. I get a little. I got a lot of heat from my wife. You know, I can't smoke indoors and stuff. As, uh, as anybody would imagine, you know, Chinese are very funny about cigar smoke in the house and all that. But uh, you know, I figure I'm paying the rent here, so I bet any, anyhow. <laughs> you know, so if any fans out there are thinking of something to buy, Johnny Valiant, they can uh, they can get you some cigars. Yeah. Right. Everybody know, uh, I got a couple buddies. I got a couple buddies who might send me some cigars now and then. I got a friend of mine out in Long Island. Mm-hmm. He gives me cigars, some real nice ones. And uh, I have another old chum of mine out in Indiana. He sends me, because I smoke a pipe too, you know, so he sends me pipe tobacco and that stuff. <laughs> you know, it's not good for your health and all that, but uh, you know, man's a creature of habit. Right. Uh, we should get a caller here. Who is this? Uh, this is Manny from Long Island. Hey, man, you got a question for Johnny Valiant? Yes, I do. I got a question for Johnny V. Uh, I, was, yeah. I was just wondering, what was it like managing uh, the original demolition? And did you think they were going to be another uh, Road Warrior ripoff, or did you think they had some potential to actually make it? Yeah, demolition. Yeah, those guys. Yeah, you know, look, I'll tell you, anybody that's in the WWF, uh, or now they call the WWE, any, any of these guys, they, uh, they have to be good or else they wouldn't be there. So, uh Big, big, strong guys, you know, and, uh, you know, very bizarre dressed and all that, you know. <laughs> well, why was your run with them uh, so short? Well, you know, you have to understand, you know, anytime you're a manager there in New York, you know, you're not like uh, Joe Torrey, you know, you're not like somebody, you know, Lupinella, you know, you, you, you know, you're not dealing with, uh, you know, with a board of trustees or something or, or whatever, you know, sign a contract. Sometimes, you um, know, 
sometimes people think somebody's a manager and they think that the guy's out there helping him do world work and taking care of his his business ventures and all this other stuff and arranging his matches. Well, there's nothing further to the truth, you know, from the truth, rather. You know, just uh, basically just somebody on television to, to add some pizzazz to the guy, you know, or her, as the case may be. And uh, basically that's what it is. Years ago in the WWF, you had guys in there like uh, Bob Redberry and these other legitimate managers uh, that actually were put with guys that didn't talk or couldn't talk. You know, a big, big, huge German guy or maybe even in those days, Colonel Monsoon, that, uh, you know, that supposedly did not speak English or whatever. So these guys would take care of their, uh, you know, speaking for them on, on television, you know, on the mm -hmm. uh, on the interview segments. But uh, the answer that gentleman's call from Long Island, I... Uh, I thought these guys would go pretty far, but like anything else, you're only going to go as far as the office wants you to go, as far as the promotion wants you to go. You either figure it in or you're not, you know. So I could be the most dynamic of managers and the most devious outside and everything else, but if it's not in the cards for these people to shine or to look well or to be supremacal in any victory or whatnot, you know, it's just forget about it, you know. But I, I thank you for that question, and I, 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 I do hear from people time to time and wonder about that tag team as well as the tag team in the AWA, uh, the Disruption Crew. These were two guys, too, that were... Um, Mike Enos and Wayne Bloom? Born as, yeah, Enos and... Uh, mm. Not John and uh, Wayne Train Bloom. And, uh, you know, these guys were great athletes and all that. They weren't as large uh, as the other fellows were, but uh, I'll tell you what, they could certainly hold their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought they got a bad... When they came to WWE, uh, I think they gave them the wrong gimmick. The was totally, yeah, it was totally... Yeah, it was totally against like uh, what they were in AWA, I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were very good over there. They didn't last too long over here in New York, the Beverly Brothers. But uh, well, you know, they did wrestle here. You know, right. uh, getting credit for that. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't even know where those guys are nowadays. I don't know if they're still in the business or not. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think the, the one was in uh, WCW for a little while, but he didn't have a very long run there either. Right. Right. Uh, they were in WCW under masks too. It's like the the new uh, Wrecking Crew. For oh. uh, it was a real short run though. Yeah, me and Mike Enos was in the WCW. Mm -hmm. He was the mall, I believe, something like that. Uh, Wait, gonna... with this uh, this broadcast now. You're up in New York, State, New York. Uh, the caller. Uh, no, the uh, yeah, the the originating broadcast. You're up in Upstate New um, York. Actually, we're not live right now. I just put a a thing up on the website if anyone to call and ask you. Uh, question they could call in. Well, uh, oh, when interesting. It's, yeah, when it's uh, playing tomorrow, it'll be all around the world. Okay, okay, it sounds good, you know. All right. We're actually all over the place right now. I'm in Massachusetts, uh, Incher is in West Virginia, and Barbie's mm -hmm. in England. Huh. Can I ask another question, friend? Sure. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, any uh, memories of the Iron Sheik, any funny stories? The Iron Sheik? Um... Well, I was thinking about him the other day. You know, I uh, I first knew him when I was up in Minnesota wrestling for Vern Gagne up there, and uh, Jimmy Valiant, myself, were there. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of strange when you look back that uh, he was basically uh, you know held a held a camp there, a wrestling camp for a lot of the uh, the wrestlers, and he broke in a lot of your great. You know, fellas like Ricky Steamboat and Brunzel and all these other ones. He was he was one of the legitimate wrestlers up there that put these guys through their paces and all that and saw to it that they were trained properly and uh, being that he was had an Olympic background. You know, the guy was a very legitimate type uh, mm -hmm. wrestler and I, I saw pictures of him when he was the Shah of Iran's bodyguard, you know, over in Iran. And this is before he had any kind of a uh, the lane in type gimmick, as we'll call it, with the shaved head and the whatnot. Funny stories. Um, I don't know. You know, he was always he was always somebody that never wanted to be comical, certainly, because he took himself so serious, and it became comical. So you never, uh, you, you know, never actually saw him humble anybody. <laughs> no, I really. No, he was always uh, very professional, and uh, I was in Japan with him a couple times, and uh, over here on the East Coast. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, not funny at all, but 
When he first came here to the WWF, when Vince McMahon's father was uh, was the promoter here in the East Coast, there was a situation, I guess it was with Jimmy Carter as president, where they had the hostage situation. I think we had around 13 or so hostages being held over the Iranian, um, over in Tehran. In fact, uh, one of these, uh, these, these, these Iranian guys you see speak on TV now very defiantly against the United States, he was one of the ones that held these people hostage over there. Anyhow, the guy with the beard, but anyhow, I was like on the main event in Madison Square Garden, and this uh, Sheik fellow, the Iron Sheik he was known at that time, I think he was on some of the earlier bouts. Well, I'll tell you, you know, being that there was a political thing on the CBS News, ABC, NBC News, of, of the hostage situation ongoing, and these people, you know, in, in the audience were chanting USA, USA, and all this other stuff, and uh, after the matches were over, you know, he and I would, you know, maybe share a taxi cab or something and leave it. Well, after the matches were over, you know, yours truly, Johnny Valiant, took a shower and the whole deal, had a couple beers. And I waited for the crowd, you know, to kind of subside. Being in those days, people outside was like a virtual lynch mob. You know, they really mm-hmm. actually politically believed everything that you did. And, and, and not that they shouldn't, but they really got caught up in it. But here's this iron sheet that they saw. And he was very... Um, reminiscent of the fact of what they had just seen on the ABC News of the hostage situations and all that. Well, they go ahead and try to, you know, turn the cab over and tipping the cab over and the cab driver didn't know for nothing as to who, who we were or anything. It looked like we just robbed the bank or whatever. You know, what, what would you guys do or whatever? But, uh, the not humorous part of it is, is, and the realistic part of it is that me, they just wanted to see get beat. Or this Iron Sheik, they wanted to see get killed because they, you know, what he represented. Mm-hmm. Now, there's no humor in that or whatnot, but yet it goes to show you how somebody can go from being Shah of Iran's bodyguard legitimately and having a wrestling camp for Vern Gagne and also the coach of the United States Olympic wrestling team uh, that was not allowed to go to the Olympics uh, that one year. So this uh, gentleman's name, Cosgrove Vaziri, alias the Iron Sheik, uh, is the real deal. Mm-hmm. So, that's my reflection on him. <laughs> uh, thanks for calling in. You got any more questions before we let you go? Uh, yeah, just one more. Uh, I know there's there's a lot of ribs going on in the 80s and the early 90s, but were there any ribs going on in their late 70s and the early 80s at that time? Ribs? Yeah. You mean uh, practical jokes, more or less? Yeah, like the pranks that were going on in the backstage, you know, Dynamite Kid stuff. Hmm. Well, the only one that I remembered was um, what I heard happened is the, the one with um, Outback Jack. And that's when uh, Outback Jack, certainly from the Australian bushes and whatnot, was having a couple beers with these fellows from England. And I, th- I do think there is a lot of competition, maybe from soccer or or rugby or whatnot, when the two countries get together, well, you know, just because you're wrestlers from Australia and England doesn't mean too much. You start, you know, drinking a, throwing a few beers at back. Things happen, and I guess uh, they got carried away, these bulldogs, and they wound up, uh, wound up, uh, you know, I guess kind of attempting to make a, a fool out of this odd back jack. I guess they had, uh, shaved his eyebrows or something and uh, put some kind of a concoction in his, in his, in his beard or something and uh, mm-hmm. I guess they thought that was kind of humorous but the next day on television boy I think this Doc Mac Jack was, was very livid he had one of those uh, one of those Bowie knives man he was looking for those British Bulldogs and uh, I guess he was going to sever them pretty good he approached me at the dinner table there, and uh, he says, uh, Johnny, he said, where are these bulldogs? You know where they're at? Well, they just left that very night for Japan. They were on a tour, so. I guess some people thought that was humorous, but uh, it goes to show you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were a great tag team, the bulldogs, and uh, but they they really liked to live life and whatnot, and after the matches were over, they used to like to drink their wine and beer and all that stuff, and 
not carry on. They were never really out of out of line or anything, but uh, they did like to pull some practical jokes. I think they even pulled the same identical type of a prank on Tiger Tiger uh, Chung Chung Lee. I think they did that to him too. I guess they put one of those uh, sleeping pills in those beer halcyons. I guess is what it was. And I guess he kind of passed out right there down in West Palm Beach at the Holiday Inn, right in the middle of the you know check-in counter or something. But uh, I don't know. I was never one for those ribs. <laughs> yeah, it seems a little, uh, <clears throat> some of those ribs seem like they go beyond just, uh, you know, fun. You're not kidding. You know, I, uh, I don't see any humor or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, thanks for calling in. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you talked about, you know, the, uh, the Valiant Brothers, obviously. Uh, did you guys have, like, instant chemistry together? You guys started a tag team? Did we have a chemistry? Yeah, like, uh, was it there, like, instantly? Not really, you know, uh, because, um, you know, you're going back now into the 70s, which here we are, 2007, but, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I had, like, about an eight-year apprenticeship, you know, uh, as a wrestler, but always basically as a good guy, and uh, traveling all over the U.S. and Canada and Japan and whatnot, and, uh, you know, learning my, my trade, you know, and learning how to, Get thrown around, take a lot of bumps and whatnot, but basically is a good guy. And uh, first territory that I went to as a villain was down in Texas, and I didn't last too long down there, and I wound up out in San Francisco. And Roy Shar is the promoter out there, put on some finishing touches there for me and kind of gave me an idea how a, how a villain should be in the ring and all that. And being that my hair was all bleached out blonde and all that, I guess I was ready made to eventually be a valiant brother. So mm-hmm. when the Bobby Heenan and Baron Von Raschke saw us up in uh, wrestling for the Bear Man, I guess he put two and two together, and Heenan was very instrumental in putting us together. And uh, although the chemistry really wasn't there, I basically followed Jimmy Valiant's lead and uh, got some trunks made like his and, and all that, and a couple jackets, and kept growing my hair longer and longer. And uh, I really don't know what it was, but I, I kind of had a, uh, an, an, uh, a knack for being able to talk on, on television because I guess I didn't take it too serious being that you just talk to the camera and that, and uh, I guess that was my introduction really into show business and to uh, being in front of an audience and all that. And things just kind of float because Jimmy was up there way ahead of me up in Chicago and Indianapolis and all, you know, as Jimmy Valiant and had a lot of main events and stuff, so whatever chemistry that we had together, most of it was because of Jimmy, because he was the one that, you know, set the set the stage up there. Uh, is, there follow, follow his lead, you know. uh, is there any heat with you and uh, Bobby Heenan? Because I've heard interviews uh, where he said he, he did enjoy uh, managing you guys. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to, you have to understand that uh, <coughs> not on my part, certainly. Um, mm-hmm. I guess anybody that, uh, whether it's uh, in professional wrestling or, you know, Muhammad Ali having heat with Joe Frazier or whatnot, you know, if you make money with somebody, you know, uh, they're the greatest guy in the face of the earth because <laughs> you make a lot of money with them or, or her. If you only do so-so, well, then maybe you have feelings about it that... Uh, with Heenan, I have no animosity towards him. I always thought he was a pretty talented guy, to a point. And um, we used to pal around a lot up in Indianapolis a lot. In fact, Jimmy and myself and Heenan would go to most of the shows together, and Baron Ron Raschke and people like that. And uh, it, uh, I guess that's kind of a compliment to get heat from Bobby Heenan. So. Yeah. I've upset him over the years. I guess that makes me more of a villain. I don't know. <laughs> uh, do you I think, think that... I don't think I don't think Saddam Hussein would get along with Hitler? Do you? <laughs> no, probably not. That, that that team would have a lot of heat, though. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Do you feel the team was as good uh, with you and Jerry Valiant? I I enjoyed working with Jerry. Um, it wasn't my decision actually to make it work that way, but uh, Jimmy and I had been in here first as champions and all, and then we went over Minnesota and L.A. and Frisco and Atlanta and all the other territories together, and uh, eventually Jimmy went his way, but 
then Jimmy and I were going to uh, come back into New York again. But what happened with Jimmy, he had a health of an issue with the hepatitis uh, after, like, doing the TV taping. So I I had to call up this man senior and enlighten him as to Jimmy Valiant's medical condition, which uh, with hepatitis, you just don't get better in a, a couple of weeks. So he left it up to my discretion to uh, think of somebody to bring in, and they would make him the third Valiant brother. So I kind of thought for a, a long period of time, and I uh, got back to him, and I chose uh, this fellow, Jerry Valiant, who was wrestling up with me in Fort Dick the Bruiser at the time, Guy Mitchell. So I gave him the name Jerry Valiant, and with McMahon's uh, senior's blessing, he says, sure, bring him on in. I'll use your judgment. If he's good enough for you, he's good enough for me type deal. And uh, all of a sudden, Jerry Valiant was born. So Jerry was completely different than Jimmy. Physically in stature, a lot, a lot larger, big bone guy. But more so than that, he was really a legitimate tough guy and an accomplished wrestler. And there wasn't nothing that he wouldn't do in the ring. And he was very respected, being that he had been in the business for many years and was a real seasoned veteran. Mm -hmm. So the adjustment that he had to make, though, to be a valiant brother was to try to try to come up with some more flamboyancy and more show busy type ring persona. He tried his best, but he, he never achieved it. But that's what made him good and made him, made him different, because Jimmy was the flamboyant one. I was the, more or less the loquacious one, mm -hmm. uh, a gifted type talker, although you wouldn't know it tonight. <laughs> and nice. um, and uh, Big Jerry Valiant was kind of like the Rock of Gibraltar. Right. So, you know, opposites attract, and uh, it just worked out fine. You know, I always enjoyed him. He was a very frugal kind of a guy on the road, you know, and a family orientated guy, and. Uh, yeah, I used to race motorcycles and all this stuff and teach the Indianapolis Police Department self-defense and all that, you know, and uh, that's what I say. He was a pretty tough guy with his fist. We had a re reunion here a while back, uh, maybe a, a year or so ago here in New York where all the Valiant Brothers got together, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a quite nice time. So. Yeah, cool. We've had uh, Jimmy Valiant on here before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a really good guest. Yeah, oh, yeah he's a good guest, yeah. Well, what did you think when uh, when he started coming up with the uh, the boogie woogie man gimmick? Ah, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me because uh, you know he's going to do whatever it takes. You know, uh, he fits right into that. You mm -hmm. know, because he's uh, you know always a show busy kind of guy. You know, always playing buoyant. You know, and uh, different. You know, he never. I don't think he ever followed anybody. I think he set his own. Uh, Little pace out there, you know. I, I, I think that was good for him to boogie woogie there. You know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was really popular. Yeah, uh, yeah, he, he, he did quite well with that down south, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he probably still does. I understand he's got a wrestling school. In fact, you know, down in Virginia. And yeah, and he still wrestles uh, in yeah. Memphis sometimes. Just released a yeah. book. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, he's got a book out in the market, a hardcover book out in the market, and. Uh, I see him maybe once or twice a year, but I hadn't seen him for years and years and years, and I had heard that he had lost a lot of weight and all that, and when I did see him a couple of years back, yeah, I could really see he was, uh, when I was wrestling with him up in New York here, you know, he was always about 270 or so, but uh, <clears throat> as, you, as you were aware of, you know, he's, uh, he's really lost a lot of weight, you know, mm -hmm. keeps, uh, you know, watches his diet and all that, and, very serious about it, and he's a good instructor and a good teacher, and, you know, he's been around the wrestling business a long time and show business and that, so he uh, he can teach his students how to conduct themselves out of the ring and how to follow your dreams and everything else. Uh, I think he'd be a good good wrestling yeah. instructor. Yeah, one thing when he was on here he really talked about was, uh, be, like you said, is uh, being different, uh, yeah. you know, to stand out. That's right. I think one of our... Uh, one of our uh, fans asked a question about him. They want to know, like, um, if you would have uh, done the Boogie Woogie Man gimmick with him at any point. Mm -hmm. I probably would have. Uh, mm -hmm. I probably would have at some point. Uh, when he was down there for Jer or for Lawler, I never really heard from Jimmy mm -hmm. uh, at all. You know, I never even went on to be a partner or to... Uh, 
be any part of it and all that. I guess he had enough going there for himself, but uh, I, I probably would have. Um, it would have been kind of interesting, but uh, sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes when you have the thing going good just by yourself, sometimes you just better let it, let it go. Mm-hmm. But, uh, although sometimes it can add a different slant to things, it can work good. That uh, when you're up there riding high, on, like Jimmy was down there, sometimes just let that well enough alone. And uh, you think you could still uh, keep like a tag team together for as long as like the Valiant Brothers, with like uh, so much TV now, and only like one or two major uh, wrestling companies? Or do you think it would get like uh, stale quick? If we were to be active nowadays, how would we do, you mean? Yeah, do you think you could still keep a team together for that long? Oh, yeah, I, I, I really don't think so. It, it would have to be the, uh, you would have to have the blessing of the uh, of the promotion, you know, to do that. Because, say what you want, but uh, I don't think things are really geared too much for that tag team wrestling mm-hmm. to be featured too much anymore. It is and it isn't, you know... Uh, I'll tell you why, because a lot of times, you know, when you, you have four different personalities in the ring, you know, it, you could be stepping on each other's toes there, you know, mm-hmm. unless you have guys like Jimmy Valiant and myself that he knew I wasn't going anywhere, and I knew he wasn't going anywhere. In other words, I knew his moves, he knew my moves, and, uh, you know, he would just uh, live happily ever after. But sometimes you get, like when Jimmy and I used to wrestle different tag teams like Joe the Duke and Larry the Accenting, and then we'd wrestle Patterson and Stevens, and we'd wrestle Crusher and Bruiser and Moose Cholak and all these different guys, and San Martino and Chief J. Strongbow and, and all this and that. But we never really wrestled the Blackjacks. We never really wrestled Tanaka and Fuji. We never really wrestled the Samoans and these kind of guys, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm sure there would have been some darn good matches, but, you know, people come and go in this business, and the tag teams certainly come and go, and even have too much longevity at all, you know. So that's all the, all hypothetical questions, but uh, I guess we would have handled it, you know, whatever came down the pike, you know. I think uh, Inter has a question. Yeah, Jason yeah. from the uh, message board, he actually uh, typed in a question. He wants to know, why why did you leave the AWA to go to the WWE? Well, i tell you, I was up there managing Hulk Hogan, you know, and... Uh, uh, and funny, I, I was looking at a tape, uh, my friend has a CD all about the AWA and all this with Vern Gagne, mm-hmm. and how all these different guys left him to come in from McMahon. Well, you had Hogan that left him, you had Gene Okerlund that left him, you had Bobby Heenan that left him. You know, you had a lot of your, you know, uh, high-profile, you know, uh, wrestlers up there that left to come in. Um when I was in the uh, AWA, you know, with Hogan and all that, you know, I, everything was doing pretty good because uh, Hogan was doing a Rocky movie and I was up there in Minnesota talking for him and all this and that. But the thing, the thing of it is, you know, they saw Hogan as a good guy and they, they felt that I was holding him back because I was a, vi- a villain manager. Mm-hmm. So they, they just cut me loose, you know. Uh, they brought me in to manage him. That was Vern Gagne that called me specifically to come in and manage this guy. And uh, it just didn't work out, you know. Uh, anytime anybody leaves the territory, you know, it's usually because they, they get rid of you. It's just whatever. You know, you're not involved there politically or whatever. Or so, you know, uh, sometimes they just cut you loose, you know. Did you see so, uh, Hulk Hogan? You know, did, you, did you tell Hogan uh, had it to be uh, to become, you know, as big as he did when you were managing him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it, you know. Yeah, he was, uh, the crowd loved him, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt you, though. You were talking about uh, uh, unions and wrestling? Yeah, well, I was saying there's, there, there is no union, you know. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no union representation. So, in other words, they can get rid of you anytime they want. Mm-hmm. Virtually pay, pay you anything they want, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, people have said, you know, some people have tried uh, to start one up at different times and, like, uh, WWE would stop them. Or, uh, did you... Yeah. Have any uh, witnessed anything like that? I had heard talk of it and all that, but believe me, it, it didn't get past much past hardly out of past at all the talking stages. Right. It's basically, it's because of the people that are in the business. You know, these people are all out for themselves. You know, there's nobody that has any loyalty only for themselves. Mm-hmm. 
And it would just wouldn't fly. It really wouldn't fly. Mm-hmm. In other words, it wouldn't make it, you know. Um, when you went back to the AWA, I'm sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, uh, when you went back to the AWA, were you surprised how much um, it had gone downhill? Yeah, yeah, I was back in there, and uh, there certainly weren't too many big stars there. Um, I mean, there was a few, a few names there. I mean, they had uh, some of these different people there. They had Brad Ringens there, and uh, Kenny Patera was there for one. Mm-hmm. which uh, I thought was a big star in my eyes, both in Minnesota and in New York. He was there, mm-hmm. and uh, and I was there. And I think they had uh, a couple other guys, and Colonel De Beers was there, yeah. and uh, maybe a Japanese wrestler or so. And uh, I think Yokozuna might have been there, too, at the time. But, yeah, uh, I think he was like a Coquina Maximus. Yeah. So we... Uh, we were up there in Rochester, Minnesota, wrestling around there and some of these other areas, but uh, the crowds had really dwindled. You know, there was no Vern Gagne, there was no Nick Bockwinkle, you know, there were no people that had been featured as champions on television for a, a long extended period of time, and there was no real big draw there. And yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I, was, I could see that the writing was on the wall there, it's a matter of time, and I was just going to go belly up, you know. Mm-hmm. We surprised how much. Saw uh, the, uh, I saw the uh, the uh, CD on the AWA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you and, happy with uh, that? Or, uh, actually, the DVD. Right. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. I think they they you know did a, an overextended amount of time with Nick Bockwinkle and these other people. And uh, I mean, you know, I'm not saying it was sour grapes up there or anything, but that's the way things are. You know, things life in cycles and whatnot, and. Uh, Vern was kind of astonished that everybody left him for Vince and and this and that, but uh, you know, people left uh, other people for Vern. You know, because right. at one time that AWA was the place to be. The reason being, you didn't have to wrestle 30 days a month to make a buck. You could be up there and wrestle uh, for a couple of weeks and be off, and Pete Vern would fly you everywhere. You know, so. Uh, it's a lot easier on your body when you're up in an airplane and it's sitting in a car for uh, eight hours, you know. Right. Especially when you're a wrestler with a wrestler with bad back and bad knees and every damn thing else. So, uh, yeah, life's funny. Are you surprised uh, WWE's buying, like, all the footage of uh, the different territories? Oh, they are? Well, yeah, you know, they, you know, they bought the AWA and um, uh-huh. they bought the NWA. Yeah, I would be, su- I would be surprised if... Uh, um, like I said, man this man doesn't surprise me because I went to military school with him down in Virginia. Oh, really? Yeah, we were we were classmates down there years ago. He was about seventeen or so. Uh, I guess I was sixteen. I'm mean, maybe he was eighteen, but uh, I guess he's the type of guy. He's got to you know, got to control everything, and he's got to have a say so as to what's what. So. Um, had he changed a lot from the time you guys were in uh, school together till uh, you know you were working for him? Yeah, you know, there's a certain amount of change everybody goes through. You know, as you as you mature, but um, I could see he was a very demanding uh, owner and CEO. Believe me, he was very demanding and uh, you know, tremendous amount of uh, imagination mm-hmm. and a real risk taker. A lot of guts, you know. And, he backed it up, you know, both monetarily and uh, physically. You know, he puts a lot of time and effort into this. People see it on television, but they don't realize the amount of preparation and uh, imagination that goes into it. Mm-hmm. However, you know, in the last five, six or so years, I understand they have writers and all this other stuff and uh, that I would not have really wanted to be part of, you know. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever wrote anything for me. Nobody ever scripted anything out there for me or no certainly we never had any kind of rehearsals or whatnot so uh everything was done on a night to night basis and uh as well as all the other old timers I know they can chime in here too. That's that's just the way it was. Mm-hmm. I know I do Sopranos up here in New York on for about six years now on the, the T V show that is. And yeah. uh I uh you know, marvel at a lot of these actors and whatnot, and I say, wow, there's Tony Soprano, there's Paulie Walnuts, there's all these other ones and all, but 
And I say, you know something, they were created only by that show because of Sopranos. But a wrestler, uh, right there all over the United States, all over the world, and doing all this other stuff, and there is no rehearsals, there is nobody writing them scripts and auditioning and all this other stuff. They right. just get in the damn ring and get in there and do it. You know, I'm thinking of guys like Bruiser and Vern Gagne's and all these other guys, Wilbur Snyder's and... Yeah, even guys like Andre the Giant, you know, just totally steal the show no matter where they go. And Hulk Hogan too, so Yeah, you can't compare you can't compare a wrestler with Hollywood T V people. Uh, I don't speak for myself, but I mean a lot of these big high profile wrestlers, uh boy, they really they really stand out in front of these movie stars, I'll tell you that. Uh, you mentioned uh Dake the Bruiser, Wilbur Snyder, and uh you you had a lot of belts for the WWA. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any footage of that left? There probably is somewhere. Yeah, I saw some. Mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, who was showing me some stuff. Yeah, they had stuff out of Chicago and all that when they had, uh, Crusher and Bruiser against, uh, me and Jimmy Valiant. And we had Billy Graham in our corner, and I don't know who they had. But, uh, yeah, I saw some of that footage, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was kind of a good old days up there in the Chicago amphitheater, you know, and the beer being thrown around and, uh, <laughs> Real big, big wing up there, and all these old time wrestlers in there, you know, getting at it. Uh, what was it yeah, like? Uh, it wasn't working? much money. It must it wasn't much money in those days. Right. Okay? But uh, for me, it was a beginning, and, and I've always, I've always stated this, and I, I still believe it. I was never really in that business for the money, you know. Mm-hmm. I was in it because that's what I liked to do. And as a young kid growing up in Pittsburgh and watching it on television. You know, I was a San Martino fan and Buddy Rogers and Johnny Valentine and all these kind of guys I would see on the tube. And uh, I was really lucky to be around these guys and wrestle with them and travel with them and kill the Kowalski and all that. So so for me, it's, uh, it's a dream come true. And at age 60, I look back on it. And when I began, I was probably in the early 20s or maybe about 20, actually. It was a long career. Mm-hmm. Every so often, I'll get a call to go wrestle somewhere. I wrestled once or twice last year. I don't wrestle too long. I can't get up and down like I used to, certainly. And I work out all the time. You know, I work out about three, four days a week. I'm about 260 pounds, and I'm in decent shape. And, uh, you know, uh, my mind's good, very active, and I do my stand-up comedy. I do my one-man shows on a stage for over an hour, talk about my life before, during, and after. And, uh, and what can I tell you? I think life's been pretty fair to me. That's, you know, um, uh, that's you why know, we you, know that's uh, Evening with Johnny Valiant. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, gentlemen, if there's another question or so, I'll be glad to answer it. Otherwise, the clock on the wall, you know. All right. <laughs> we got a, you, got a, you got a last question there, Incher? Uh, Rio is from the message board. Uh, he wants to know, are there any perks to being a WWF Hall of Famer, or do you use the plaque as a paperweight? I have, uh, yeah, I, I got that in 1996, it was. Mm-hmm. Back with Jimmy Valley, myself. We were there at Monsoon, Jimmy Snooker, and uh, Connor Kowalski, Baron Ciclona, Johnny Rods. Yeah, I have it hanging on my wall over in Pittsburgh. And uh, it was, it was kind of nice, certainly, to be uh, acknowledged. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've never ever considered myself any kind of a celebrity. You know, uh, people remind me of what I used to do or who I they feel that I am. But uh, you know, you have to always remember that there's three things. One of which is uh, who do people think you are, and then it's who you think you are. But the real thing is who you really are. So you know, you can hide behind. Uh, being a wrestler, hide behind doing this or doing that, but it's who you really, really are in life, uh, in all actuality, you know, behind the scenes and when all the smoke clears and everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had to what kind of person you really are. And, uh, you know, what can I say? I, I was I was kind of blessed to be in that uh, business, you know, and uh, but I, I still embark and have aspirations and dreams for show business, you know, being a being a, a comic, a stand-up comic, I was always drawn towards that with guys like Don Rickles and Jerry Lewis and uh, Don Rickles, people like that. You know, they always kind of had my attention out there. I, I watch comedy on television now. Some of it is very embarrassing. Nor I wouldn't consider myself to do that kind of 
mm-hmm. that real, you know, blue stuff, you know, it's a little bit too dirty for me, and I'm still yeah. a family man at heart, and, uh, but, um, yeah, I guess Hall of Fame is nice and all that, but there's a lot of other guys that should be in there, too, and maybe someday they'll get a chance, so, yeah. Gentlemen, I appreciate you thinking enough to have me on your show. You know, and uh, really appreciate you coming on here. Strange, there's no real, no real, no <laughs> inner reaction with the internet. That uh, the internet is a very valuable tool when it's used right, and um, it's a great communicational device. And uh, I have a website. It's uh, Johnny Valiant. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Valiant dot net. Mm-hmm. And I have people that run it out there for me, and every so often I get on there and respond to some of the fans and callers and requests or whatnot, and uh, mm-hmm. I'll just let it go with that, all right? All right. Now, so everybody know you got the absolute truth about pro wrestling. It should be coming out this year, documentary. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming on here. Really appreciate it. Okay. Good night, everybody. Right. See ya. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. God bless you. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, again, man, in your head, man. Hey, hey, Luscious, uh, 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 Luscious One Inch Bicep, man, and, and Handsome Jack, man. Oh, mercy. Booker, Booker, man, feel good. I'll tell my people, all my brothers and sisters, don't you dare miss in your head every week, baby. God bless you all. Hey, Get them get them uh, uh, DVDs, man. Woo, Mercy, the Jimmy Vine experience, the Memphis Heat, and Ultimate Death Match. And check out JimmyValiant.Weebly.com. Woo, Mercy. Love you guys. Hey, see you soon, man. God bless. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thanks, man. That was great.